Okay, so um, the next time Shimashi came to Bristol was in October 1982. This was her third visit. And of course, you know, we were seeing her um, at public meetings, pujas, and um, at her house in Brompton Square in London. But, um, you know, the closest we were to her generally was at these meetings in Bristol. Um, so, yeah, we, we were living this time. Um, <clears throat> we'd had to move out of the flat in York Road where she had been the previous two occasions. And um, the landlord had gone a bit funny. He lived in the basement. And we found this um, very nice flat in an old vicarage around the corner, very close to where the other one was. And um, I mean, that was kind of miraculous in a way because we we got the place, uh, but it was unfurnished. We didn't have it was any the housing furniture. association. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have any money either, really. And um, we went around to see it, and that was when we found, that's it, yeah. So we lived in the ground floor um, on the... Left of the door. Yes, as you look at it, it's mm. on the left of the door, that and big window. And the room window. behind, and the, yeah. the kitchen. And, um, and over to the, beyond the window, so to the extreme left of the picture, there's a little park which uh, used to be a graveyard. So that will come into a story I'm going to tell, uh, or Ruth's going to tell shortly. Um, so this was the old vicarage. They built bits on over to the right here. That was all new. And there were a lot of different flats. And that, that that room there on the left of the door is where Sri Mataji stayed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we got that flat. And then we went around to see it. And my grandfather, out of the blue, had um, sent a cheque uh, saying he'd done rather well on the stock market. And uh, I, it was, yeah, it never happened before. Um, so we had the money to buy furniture. Yeah, well. so we were able to get everything we needed, um, which was really, really fortuitous. I mean, it, it did seem miraculous at the time. And then and also we were living somewhere else and it just so happened because we had to wait a long time for this housing association flat that we decided to go back to our old flat and check if there was any mail for us oh, and we only had a few yeah. days left it had been delivered there telling us we had this place quite a while before and you know we had literally one or two days in which we could accept the offer and we picked the the letter up and, and that's, that's yeah it. um so anyway yes Sri Machi came there and um <clears throat> so we had a, a meeting again in Bristol and there was afterwards uh, we had dinner there at home and you cooked and there was a, the Basmati. Oh yeah that was interesting. quite interesting yeah so I was cooking the meal um, and the year before I'd also cooked when she came and uh, I hadn't used Basmati rice that time and she said it's wonderful she was very complimentary about my cooking she said you should always use Basmati rice so this time I should say that it wasn't so easy to get basmati rice at this time. I mean, it's very common now you go into any supermarket and you can find oh, it. It's easier, yeah. Um, but but it, anyway, yeah. yeah, I I was very busy because we were trying to prepare for mother coming and I was organising the cooking and someone had to go and get the rice from the local shop and um, they came back and they said they didn't have basmati rice. So it was, and I felt bad because mother had said, always use basmati rice so anyway i prepared the meal and then i was in the kitchen saying to janet oh i feel awful i should have used basmati rice and this kind of thing and then someone came through and said she is asking for you so i went into the sitting room and um she said ruth where did you get this rice she said this is the very best quality basmati rice we can't even get this in london <laughs> so yeah. that was that was strange was it that all the way along or you know yeah you know, well, I, was, I, I remember we bought it and it was in a sack you know yeah. it was uh it wasn't in a sort of plastic oh, was it packet, you buying so. it yeah i think oh, so right, yeah yeah, yeah and, they were in big sacks but they didn't know what it was in the shop and um so yeah it was very um, amazing actually it yeah. was a nice thing Funny. anyway yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so, proper aged uh, rice because the older it is, the better it is and the more fragrant and flavorsome. So yeah, gosh. And so unconsciously you had unknowingly just the best rice. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so after that meeting in Bristol, um, mother went down from our flat, so she was just staying in our flat, um, to Exeter for a, a meeting there. And we had, a, in the afternoon, we had um, a little puja. I think Greshna had arranged it, and because they had a, Greshna and Pat had a connection with Exeter people. And um, it was very small. It's amazing. There hardly puja. anybody there, probably about... So who, who were the sorry? Who were the Exeter people? Greshna and Pat had so, a connection, but they lived in London. Is that yeah. right? Um, so there was uh, Ian and um, Tara Bascom. Bascom, yeah, and um, a few other people around there. Adam Morgan and um, I don't think he was there then. Oh well, anyway, there yeah. were a few people, yeah. but mainly it was Ian and Tara. Uh -huh. um, so we, yeah, we went down, had the puja, which was lovely, and um, I had gone with Linda, Linda Williams, and her um, son, Dr. Tatria, who was very small, and Ruth had gone with Srimachi, is that right? In, in your when we went her, down right? to, and she was talking all the way about, uh, well, she was talking near the West Country about how Jesus must have been around all these places, and how beautiful they were and that was interesting yeah and then she said at some point she said england wales and then the world so that was also yeah. interesting but yeah, what yeah. it meant i don't know <laughs> so, um yeah we so we had the meeting in exeter and i went well and then it came time to go home and um so i came back with linda and her son little son and ruth went back yeah, English. Nick Carswell was yeah. driving and Shimachi, I came and Shimachi was in that car. I, uh, who else was there? Was it Pamela Bromley? I think it was Nick, Pamela and myself, um, Shimachi. So the problem was that I had the key, the only key to yeah. the flat. Um, but that didn't seem a problem because I think we left slightly yeah, and, ahead of them. Yeah, well, well, no, we left before you, Did Chris, you? Right. and And I, I realised within a five minutes that we I hadn't got the key. Yeah. And then she mattered she said, perhaps we should go back and see if they're still there. So the so, keys to the this house in the Vicarage. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we, we went, went down back. yeah, we're down in Exeter at this point. Yeah. yeah. So we went back to the meeting place uh, and they'd gone. And they had the key. Yeah. And then we were driving happily along the M five, the motorway up to Bristol, when the car broke down. And um, fortunately, it was just by this service station. So we were able to sort of take refuge there. Data, the little boy, was having a tantrum. And, uh, oh, my God, he just wouldn't stop crying. But anyway, um, so we called the AA, and it took a long time, and we got towed back to Bristol. Meanwhile, eventually. Eventually, yes, <laughs> hours later, yeah. We got back to the old vicarage, and, of course, we didn't have the key. and. So I was in the car with Pamela and Nick. And the, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, of course, there were no mobile phones. No. So we weren't in communication. No, no mobile yeah. phones at all. You know, you were just stuck when things like this happened. So we were sitting outside the old vicarage with Shimachiji in the front seat. It's about 10 o'clock. Yes, it was, it was quite late at night, yeah. yeah. And um, she kept, every so often, she'd say, go and try the, no, I think she, she had some keys in her bag, and she said, go and try these keys in the door, and they didn't work, you know, and then, so it went on for a while, this, and then she fell asleep in the front seat, and she was snoring, I remember, and I was thinking, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? I mean, you know, Say she matched you wants to use the bathroom or something. What are, what are we going to do? You know, and this kind of things were going through my head. Eventually, she woke up and she said, "They still weren't there." This was another two hours later, maybe. And um, so she said, uh, "Let's go and get a drink or something." So we 
we drove Brown Bristol at this stage and um you know we everywhere was shut basically but there was a kind of um kiosk at the side of the road which was selling drinks and so she said oh let's let's stop here and so we had hot chocolate I remember and then I remember Nick saying but you know what if you've got a good a bad liver mother should you have hot chocolate she said oh just have less milk very good when you she said it's very good when you at night hot chocolate <laughs> and so we enjoyed our hot chocolate and then we started driving back and um I remember she her saying because I was giving directions and I'm not really exactly good at that sort of thing but she must goodness you know all these this so well <laughs> just quite funny <laughs> then, uh we got back to the old vicarage again and we were in front of the building and I said, oh no this is really late at night by now and after a while um she said oh that's right while we were we were going around getting the hot chocolate and so on. Alan, my brother, had meanwhile come back, seen that he couldn't get in because he didn't have a key either, thought that Sri Mataji must be sleeping inside and didn't want to disturb her, so lay down in his car in the front seat and tried to sleep. In the meantime, we came back to the old vicarage again. Right. <laughs> he didn't see us because he was lying down and we didn't see him. What am I? Yeah. <laughs> so then mother said, um, well, is there anywhere else we can stay? And the funny thing was that Alan had really wanted she must to go to the flat that he was currently living in, oh. which was not suitable at all. We've been but we'd there actually briefly, lived there yeah. before. But it wasn't suitable for mother. The you know, it was a tiny little toilet and you know, your knees touched the door when you and that sort of thing, and it just and there was a mattress on the floor and so on. So he really wanted her to go there. And, and she said, is there anywhere else we can go? And so I said, well, there is Alan's. <laughs> it's Trimatogy. So she said, let's go there. <laughs> so we drove to, to this other place and um, wasn't far. And uh, Alan Richards opened the door, very surprised to find, covered in cum cum and very surprised to see mother the door, you know. It was about and, two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it was really, really late. So the f irony was that mother ended up staying there, but Alan was asleep in the, in the front of the old vicarage. Never knew anything about it or saw it, you know, he did in the morning. So anyway, mother slept in the, the bedroom, which was a mattress on the floor. And we, that was Pamela, Janet Ridley, myself, slept in the corridor, which was the match, the carpet was just on a stone floor. It was really... I remember it was really cold. Yeah. And so mother but, said, in the morning, can you wake me up at eight o'clock? I think she said. And so at eight o'clock in the morning, Janet and me went into the bedroom. We didn't know how to wake mother up. We thought, well, we can't, you know, what, what do we do? So we just bowed down, but we were so tired. We fell asleep. We fell asleep bowing down. <laughs> anyway, eventually she woke up and then she was saying, what's happened? And, you know, she... She was enjoying the kind of drama of it all. And she said, now, you better go and ring Chris and yeah. see what's happened. So I had to go to a phone box. We didn't have a phone there. There was no mobiles. And then I had to come back. Oh, yes. And then I apologised to Mother. I said, I'm so sorry, Mother, that you had to sleep on this mattress. And she said, what are you sorry for? It's a w <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> it's a lovely bed, you know. And um, so, yeah, so I had to go and... She wanted to know all the story of what had happened to Chris and Linda and so on. <laughs> and then later on, she said that the reason she was sitting in the car asleep was because that was a graveyard that had been turned into a children's mm. playground. and Outside the old yeah, village, yeah. And she was clearing it. And also she said that I was soon to have a child, didn't she? And mm. it was just after she went that I became pregnant. Yeah. 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 Because so, there was... Yeah. The, yes, it... This um, graveyard had been turned into a playground the and the church that had belonged to it had been bombed in the war, so it, that had disappeared. So it wasn't really obvious that it had been a graveyard, but, yeah, it was. So yeah. the whole thing was this yeah. beautiful Maya. It was such a sort of Sri Krishna-type yeah. Maya. The whole no, it's, also, 
yeah. enjoyed it so much. You know, finding out what had happened to Chris, and yeah, and you'd be like, oh, tell her. And then just... when she went, we were all in the hall, and um, I remember Mother was driving back to London with Mick, and Janet lived in London, but she was too shy to ask Mother if she could go in the car with them. And, I, so I said, because it's easier to ask for someone else than you yeah. yourself, isn't it? So I said, can Janet come back in the car with you? And she said, of course she can come back. Would you know? And um, she, then she told us how nice the meetings were in Bristol and how she liked the style we were doing them with nice cups of tea and cakes. And <laughs> <laughs> so were you baking a cake? And we, we had a Janet and me had bought a stationery set. Was Sri Mataji, you know, just oh. and we gave it to Sri Mataji then, and, and that was it. That was the whole mire of the of the old yeah. Christmas. It was quite a funny. It was very funny. Yeah, I think I, it, I think it's better actually on this um recording because I remember the last one. It was a bit difficult because there was interruptions from someone, and he didn't remember. You know, he wasn't he yes. wasn't there. Yes. <laughs> it was so right. funny. <laughs> like I sort of lost my th thread. I couldn't. Yeah. Anyway, that I wonder what what one wanted to ask was, you know, you you, you cooked that lovely basmati rice. What else did you cook for Shrimantiji? Um, I think it was like a risotto. It was like chicken and various vegetables and so on. Nice. And for the year before, it was lamb. I think lamb and rice. Oh. And, and what would you I give the melon for? Mel melon, 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 and I sort of did little boats with kind of cherries, and then mother ate several of those. She liked. Yeah, she, she said. said that. She said how much she liked melon. Yeah, and uh, yeah, she she was very nice about my cooking all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. <laughs> what did you serve her for breakfast? Oh, I cannot remember that. At no. All. no, it's a bit too far. Yeah, I mean, no. just curious. <laughs> That's yeah, it. yeah, I know. The, the, English. <laughs> I mean, you know. It was all, there wasn't anybody really to help. So it was just kind of me. Yes, exactly. And you're hosting. And there were lots of people mm. as well. So and I had to be yeah. cooking for 30 people or something. Exactly. You know, a little kitchen. And yeah. So yeah, it was, mm. it was amazing, really. Yeah. And she mattered you was just so sweet. And the old vicarage, she, um, I remember in the morning, we were still in our, of nighties and things because I slept in the bedroom with Shumachi. She said, "Come and sleep in the bedroom with me." And Pam was there as well, so it was right. Pam and me and Shumachi in the bed. And I thought I wouldn't go to sleep. I was the three of you in the bed. Wow. No, no, we were on the floor. Shumachi. The floor. And Shumachi. I, I thought I wouldn't go to sleep, and and Shumachi started snoring immediately. I was asleep. Yeah. And um, in the morning, Shumachi patted the bed and told me to come and sit next to her on the bed. And, then she started telling me about how I'm always looking out for things for you to do, Ruth. You know, like she often used to talk to me about how I should have a shop and about clothes. And, um, you know, everywhere I go, I'm I'm looking for things that you can do. And, you know, talking to me like this. It was very sweet. Mm. Very sweet. Just so motherly. And so yes. she, she always has her attention on me and, you know, trying to look for options, you know avenues for me oh wow mm. yeah very sweet so so then um then the next year that's i remember actually yeah later that year um she told me i was writing a book it was a children's book and she said yes bring it to me i'll i'll abandon it for you and um i was very you know didn't really feel like barging in and it just so happened uh, at after a meeting at the Caxton Hall again that year, um, November it was in eighty two, <clears throat> and someone they were all saying goodbye to mother, and someone asked me to take a, I don't know some part of a clock or something or other. So um, again, like you saying, it's easy to ask for other people. So I I went up and then I gave it handed it over and I said, oh, could you abandon my book and. She gave it a very vigorous, very sort of concentrated band. And I, nothing came of that particular book. And I kind of, you know, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. But, um, you know, things did come out of that in a way. So the next year, 83, 
the big thing for us was our first child, Lakshmi, was born. And um, Sri Mataji said uh, to your brother, who was in London mm. with her, because, uh, of course, she was born in Bristol, um, that's good. Uh, they can call her Lakshmi. They need some of that, she <laughs> said. <laughs> so, which was true. Um, and so... Yeah, but you've yeah. even said about what happened when she'd been to the uh, to the old, not to the old British, to the ashram after she left. Mm -hmm. Tell me. We got the house. Yeah. No, that was that was the following. That was Bushy Park. Oh, Bushy Park, yeah, the ashram, yeah, I yeah. said, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that comes later. So, yeah, the, yeah so <clears throat> in 1984, so there'd been a two year gap, she came for the fourth and last time. Bristol in August and um, by this point we'd had to give up our nice flat in the old vicarage um, due to the demands of the collective who wanted us to all move into an ashram together so um, yeah that was a bit of a wrench because, yeah it was because a we a just got this nice little nest and it was yeah the three of know, us and then door. having to yeah. having to sort of go and live in the ashram which wasn't as so nice in a way you know what I mean it wasn't yeah, a bad it wasn't place, bad, yeah. But yeah. And it, this was bought by Bernard's mother. Bernard was one of the people moving in with us. Um, so, you know, it was lucky, really, that we were able to choose the house. Yes. And um, <clears throat> we moved in. And there were, I don't know, five or six of us probably living there. Oh, it was more. Sometimes it was up to eight, yeah, or nine even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite. This a lot. is nineteen eighty four. Okay. So yeah, this is nineteen eighty four, and then in August, mother came there, and um, this was, I suppose, everything was getting more serious in a way in Saji Yoga. It was getting bigger. She'd been traveling in Europe, so there were a lot of uh, and around mm. the world, I guess. Mm. Um, so there were more foreign yogis abroad um and yes it was getting bigger and it was sort of less getting less easy to be close to mother physically you know because she there were so many demands on her time so this was very special this last visit mm, yes. uh, um <clears throat> she talked to me i don't know i talk about we went one of the days she was there we went shopping and I don't think you were. No, I didn't uh, come. I was cooking. Yeah, cook. Um, but it was very interesting. I mean, when you were with Mother, she's absolutely alive, you know, and you feel alive. And um, she's a, sort of drawing your attention to everything. Um, she was talking, <clears throat> you know, about, say, where we part in sort of one of the central parts of Bristol, right. uh, where there's a lot of. This was Victorian architecture, and she was pointing it out and saying, you know, how nice it was. And then she would, we went into a department store, and she was pointing at various sort of dolls and how strange mm. they were. Um, it was one of those Star Wars characters, um, yeah. the evil emperor, I think. And she was saying how this was sort of, this, it kind of showed well the super yeah. conscious the sort of dark super conscious and then she would sort of she was choosing some she wanted to buy some um plates it was for the cp wasn't it, it yeah was a set of some formal plates wasn't it? yeah i think they were more sort of everyday kind of mm -hmm. plates she wanted and we chose some and she said they're very sort of bauhaus ish which she didn't like i'll come on to that in a minute um and but then she found some that were okay and she talked about cp a bit uh, i remember one thing she said <laughs> was um it just struck me as a very deep comment about the goddess and how she wants us to live our lives and she said one can have too much sobriety you know you can be too straight yeah lace too serious too really yeah um that was the pure implication title, i suppose yeah 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 uh, and you know this we need this 
playfulness. We need um, the ability to make mistakes, as I mentioned earlier, you yes. know, and, and the uh, to uh, allow that in ourselves and in mm. other people, of course, mm. I think. So, um, and she, yeah, she talked about, I think she asked me about one of the yoginis who was living in the ashram, uh, you know, things like that. So, but it was, yeah, fascinating. And she want, she was looking for a tie for her CP. And we went in, um, around this department store, the clothing part, and um, uh, she uh, was feeling all the ties. And of course, as Bristol is Vishudi, you know, this was very kind of relevant, although she didn't actually buy me. And I was thinking, it suddenly popped into my head. I mean, I, you know, it wasn't something I would normally think, but, oh, it'd be nice if she bought me something. And um, I said, no, no. Very, don't. very human, very childlike. Uh, yeah, yeah All too human. Yeah. And um, so we walked out of that show and she said, Chris, I want to buy you some shoes. So um, we went into a shoe shop and uh, she bought me a pair. And then she said, yes, they're good. Yeah, try these on as well. So she ended up buying me two pairs of shoes. And um, mm -hmm. it was just such a... A motherly mm. gen the generosity mm. of it, and the, yeah, I mean, one pair would have been nice, of course, but two pairs really sort of yeah. underline that generosity. Yeah. And, um, yeah, being, of course, you know, symbolically, I was thinking, golly, I've got a long way to go, I need two pairs. But anyway, um, so now the other main thing for me at that um, time she came to stay was she talked to me she so she took me into um she was staying in our bedroom and there was just me and her at this point and she gave me this talk about art and she wanted me to write this book about art i mean she she without anything having been said i had been really trying to write just such a book Mm. More or less since I'd finished, uh, I did a postgraduate course in Birmingham. Um, in, and I sort of, for the dissertation I had to write, it was really working on this idea about the history of art. But it never came to anything. Um, but it's still at the back of my mi mind, it was there that I want to do this. And she um, said, do you want to turn the light on? Yeah, it's icon? getting yeah. dark. Isn't yeah. It? Um, so she talked to me about the whole history of art and she wanted to write, write a book about it. And so for about an hour she talked, well, I took notes. Unfortunately, I, we didn't have any recording um, equipment, but I, I was writing down. She was telling me, you know, this and that. Do you want to read out an excerpt from your diary? Because it's one of the things you've done, Chris, that, you know, Shamataji wanted us to write our diaries. Yeah, uh, there uh, is not on that particular uh, advice that she gave you. Um, right? Let me just try and bring it up on the my online diary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me just click in here. <clears throat> And it's interesting, isn't it, how you and the whole family is into art? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we like... love. We we are all very conscious of beauty, and yes. the beauty of buildings, art, everything. It's very common to all of us. It's it's nice actually because you can really share. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ruth's mother was an artist, uh, professional artist for a time, and my grandfather. Um, had an art gallery in St. James's, just really near the Caxton Hall, and, uh -huh. uh, where he sold very charming, mainly um, 19th century, early 20th century, mainly English art. Um, yeah, lovely stuff. So I was sort of brought up with that background. Yeah, it was fascinating. Mother told me I had a good eye so mm -hmm. that was <laughs> nice um because that gave me confidence that my judgments about art have some validity 
note because the mm. trouble is that everything is so relative in our current culture and one can say anything about anything yeah. who are, you know who am i to say yeah but mm. spiritually speaking this is true art and that is bad art you know so there's uh, right and left side yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah so some of the things she was saying um <clears throat> in that talk about art how uh, uh, so from my, my little notes, um, yes, there she is in oh, yes. the um, ashram in the meditation room. In... And she just bought this um, this cape kind of um, coat yeah, when that we've day. Yeah, we out shopping. And yeah. she was very pleased with it and she put it on. But the you know how sometimes when you buy things from shops, the buttons are not sewn on very well. Mm. And the top button wasn't on well. And I, oh. I, sewed, I just sewed the button on that. And then she was standing there having... Having her picture taken, yeah, yeah, it really suits her. I think, it's yeah, kind of sleeveless, and she and, looked yeah. very childlike, like when children have something. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a lovely combination with the sari, mm. uh, green border and the red. Um... Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so yes, yeah, she was saying how there's no love in modern art. Uh, mm. She was talking about um, particular painting by French artist Gerico. At least that's what came into my mind when she was talking about this. Uh, it's an image of a horse in a, with lightning striking and how panicky the horse looks and so on. Uh, and that, that, that was a good picture. Um, yeah, but she talked all about, yes, the whole history and little things like in the Middle Ages, the images we see of women um, showing high foreheads with the hair scraped back and maybe even the, the hair cut back a little, oh, they did, shaved yeah. a little, uh, and how this was a sign of ego developing in the West. Right. Um, and love goes out, art becomes a profession. I'm just reading some of these notes because um, I had to write very quickly. Of course, please do continue. She talked about Michelangelo and Blake as her favourite artists. And um, yeah, I said about Michelangelo, I said, but he wasn't wasn't exactly happy, was he, mother? And she said, who would be? <laughs> <laughs> and that really struck me because I thought, yeah, this world is a difficult place and mother understands that. Mm. You know, and it's a very difficult place for artists who are trying to produce something yeah. that manifests compassionate power. This, this phrase she used at that time uh, in that talk a lot. She said, this is what art should be doing now, expressing compassionate power. So I've always um, prayed for the ability, if possible, to communicate the compassionate power of God. She talked about Leonardo, how he, such a great soul, such a, an amazing genius, but how he got into wanting power and how he lost his value, his sense of his value, and how he killed himself. And I said... Um, Did he? Well, I said, that's not in the books, you know, it's not in the history uh, that he killed himself. Yes, it's, that's right. Uh, I mean, not that we are aware of. Yeah, and she, she sort of just looked into herself and sort of put her attention on this, and then she opened her eyes and said, Yes, definitely. I know this somehow. He killed himself. So, uh, because he lost his sense of value. And I, I thought. Self worth, yeah. Yes. Um, this is something, you know, it's easy to lose your sense of value in the society, especially as an artist, um, if your work is just not recognized at all or it doesn't seem to be wanted. Um, and I mustn't do that. So far, I've lost my sense of self worth, but yes, it is difficult. So I felt there was she was some, saying something of collective importance, but also something for me. Um, yeah, she talked about Tolstoy and industrial development and how this sort of, you know, kicks the ego even further into being. Um, and. Then she talked about how uh, uh, she's particularly concentrating on French art for some reason. Um, um, 
modern contemporary French art, which she did not like. She said, this is how, this is how. She repeated it, really emphasizing that. Point. But mm. also, yeah, the Bauhaus, this was this art school that was founded um, by Gropius um, in about 19, yeah, the early 20s. And that this was the climax of the attack um, in the West, just before Mother's birth, that uh, this sort of cultural attack. So she was really, I mean, she hasn't spoken much about the arts in particular in great detail in her public talks, you know. She mentions them here and there. Then. But here I felt she was really stressing the importance of this, the importance of um, both, you know, art as beautiful and compassionate, but also art as expressions of negativity. You know, culture is um, so much negativity in the West, especially now, of course, it's spreading everywhere. Yes. Um, and the Bauhaus, this art school, <clears throat> uh, which was really, I mean, it's most famous for modern architecture, modernist architecture, these big tower blocks, this dead style which I see as super conscious, um, which spread from Germany. The Nazis didn't like the Bauhaus and uh, because it was modern, you know. So they moved to America and there from America it spread all around the world, this epidemic of this modernist architecture which we still live with. And um, um yeah, this was very negative. So she actually really wanted me to stress that. So um so I, and then she came up with a name for the book. She was sort of running through a various things from art to truth, art in the light of truth. And then she said, art, love and truth. And it's such a, for me, you know, this was such a strong, a kind of passionate title, whereas I would have thought of something a little more cool and kind of intellectual sounding, I think. But it really demanded a certain kind of way of writing a book. And so I eventually I did write the book. Here, here it is, Art, Love and Truth, oh, um, yes. which took me a very, very long time. When your Kundalini came up? Oh, yeah. When, yeah she, when she was giving me that title, Art, Love and Truth, she I could feel whoosh. And she said, ah, your Kundalini comes up, you know. So, ah. um, yeah, I felt it would, it would happen. And... Um, Really, I mean, nice to be blessed by the Adi Shakti herself yeah. and to have that sort of experience. I felt it wouldn't be much use trying to get it published through conventional publishers. I made a small attempt, but um, there was no interest. But very luckily, um, Felicity and her husband Richard Payment moved to Bristol and they live just outside Bristol, and he helped me publish it and it's helped me publish several things so what was, was the writing advice that that you got from Shumashi and what sort of how did you go about researching because uh, from my very limited experience of researching for any writing project dissertation one gets very mental yeah it's it's difficult I mean I made actually I wrote three versions of the book and the first version was more, I suppose you'd say, more scholarly, um, uh, perhaps a bit dry, uh, and kind of seeing it through a conventional intellectual's eye, rather. Um, and it didn't quite work. I mean, it didn't quite satisfy me, and it didn't really quite work. So then I wrote another um, version, which was more about the qualities of spiritual art, as I see, like balance and uh, inspiration and innocence and, and so on. And that was okay, but a bit half-baked. And then finally, I wrote something that I feel um, integrates the sort of scholarly side of it, the research side, um, but it's not too heavy or dry. And mm -hmm. the more passionate um, spiritual aspect that I'm trying to <laughs> excuse me weave into and and promote through the book so 
Tell yeah. me, tell us about the advice on writing that Shramataji oh. gave you. That's really interesting to know the amount yeah. of effort you put into this project. And yeah, there was no, <clears throat> excuse me, specific um, mm -hmm. advice, but she, I mean, she did say, try and concentrate on one thing at a time. She said, I have the same problem. She said, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, because my attention tends to get, you know, spread out to various different projects and so on. So another nice little thing that happened that same uh, talk was um, she asked to see some photos that I'd taken. So um, she just... I mean, she did say, yes, you, you must take more photos of sort of architecture and so on, and we must go visit some art galleries together. Mm -hmm. you know, it never happened, but what a lovely idea. I mean, I actually, I it did happen in a way in Italy some years later. We were both in the Uffizi, but um, there were other people in the world. So, yes, yeah, she asked me to uh, show her some photos, and I just showed her the last batch I'd taken. Of course, they weren't digital in those days. What photos so, were they again? Um, so they were just pictures of, we'd been, some of them were of Ruth and our child, Lakshmi. Uh -huh. and, holiday but, in Cornwall. Yeah, on holiday in Cornwall, that's right. I mean, it's actually, I, okay. I wish I'd said this to her, but um, near where my grandparents, my grandmother lived, where we were staying, down there um, is a place where Jesus is said to have gone. There's a, a well called the Jesus Well there. This, What's the name of that place, Chris? So that's uh, Rock. It's a place called Rock. Uh huh. Uh, R O C. R O C K. Oh, it's a yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. On the Lizard Peninsula, is it? It's no. It's further north. It's we lived in Port Isaac, um, which okay. is a village on the north coast. And um, it's sort of near there, near Padstow, on the opposite side of Pad of the okay. Camel River, Camel Inlet. Oh yes. And uh, there's a very interesting hill there, which is a sort of what they call a mammalot. It's like a round, a kind of breast shape hill. Mm -hmm. And there were some photos of that. And I wish I'd said, you know, this is where Jesus. Is supposed to have gone and so on because the vibrations there yeah, are amazing, ama absolutely yeah. amazing. And the story, yeah, Camelford, is it the place called Camelford? Is what uh, that be close? That's on the River Camel, but this is where the Camel Estuary, where it comes out to the sea. So the story the camel is, is in uh, Camelford's in yeah, there. He came in the ship up the Camel Estuary with his uncle, that's Joseph right, Arimathea, who was uh, involved with the tin mining. Yes industry and so they came up the camel estuary and there's a lot of tin in Cornwall and then they came up yes. this way and you know near Bristol we've got places also with the um legend of stories about the Jesus yeah up on the and moment the staff, Glastonbury for Stone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, the, the lead the old lead mines on the Mendip Hills which are yeah. a little way north of Glastonbury and um yeah, around there, so again, very similar vibrations. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't usually talk like this, but I just did genuinely yeah. and feel And our this. girls used very to go similar mad vibrations to the ones in Cornwall. Yeah. Very happy yeah, yeah. That yeah, yeah, and there's lots of lots of indentations and. Uh, From the old lead mines. Yes, they also had silver and silver and something else mines as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, no, I don't know what else we should say. Uh, while you're trying to uh, go through your notes, because it's been very, very nice to hear about your chat with Shramataji. I mean, I'm calling it chat, but really uh, an audience with Shramataji, the goddess herself. Um, Ruth, would you share with us the presence that Shramataji uh, gave, you know, like she was always very generous. Um, oh, yes. Um I sh did I show the bell? I showed the bell before. You've shown you? the bell, yes. So another one was um this beautiful pearl necklace. Lovely, gosh. And um, you can she, feel the cool. Yeah, and I think she gave some other yoginis mm -hmm. the same one. And it's a beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Weight it has, and 
beautiful clasp as well, which actually a couple of the stones have come out of, but it, it was um it was a very when it, yeah. and the stones hadn't dropped out, it was very beautiful. And um also she gave me this. Beautiful, yes, lovely. Is, um, maybe a bit like the three channels in yes, the so. winding. Mm -hmm. And um, also she gave me um, two pairs of pearl earrings. Mm -hmm. uh, did I, I told you privately about this, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the so one, one pair was um, see, uh, fresh water pearls mm -hmm. and it was, they were like Sahasrara's sort of big circles. Yeah. With lots of, little freshwater pearls on them and um obviously she gave me them at Judy Camps and I was very happy <clears throat> but when I took them away I thought oh it's a shame because I can't wear them because the posts were not um it's a metal which makes me react and uh so the next day um Nita who was working cooking and so on for Shumatiji at the time looking up helping her um came in with some real pearl earrings for me on gold. Mm -hmm. And said, um, she said, mother says, give Ruth these as well. And um, then I said, oh, that'll go with the pearl necklace she's given me. And I was obviously very happy. Um, yes. This is, where was this, in a seminar? That, or? that was in Shudi Camps because... Um, I went down to Shudi Camps for quite a long time. I can't remember exactly how many days, but mm -hmm. um, Shri asked me to go down there to um, do some sewing. Right. And so while I was down there, um, which was an amazing time, because she was just there with her family and there were only a few other, yes. three other Sahaja Yogis there. Mm -hmm. Which year was this? Can you please remind us? It was in uh, 1991. 91, okay. I had, wait a minute, I'm just trying to work it out. Yes, that would have been in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there for, I think, about 10 days or something, and Chris was looking after the girls because I'd been asked to go down, and I just, just went down. And um, it was... Mm -hmm. So I was doing all, uh, taking up a lot of trousers for her relatives and her CP. And I think it was 16 pairs of tr trousers, I seem to remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the other thing was to make a, a jacket that her CP had, because he had one shoulder higher than the other. And I had to make, I mean, it sounds impossible. And I, I thought it was impossible. One shoulder lower and still looking you know oh wow really smart and like you know so it had to be lowered and then somehow I had to set the sleeve back in and um so uh, there was this amazing time when I was in mother's room and she was sitting in her chair and <clears throat> Sir CP was standing and I had to pin the jacket on him right mother was just looking at me mm. and it was just it was just blissful. I mean, I cannot... Well, there was one other time when I remember feeling this same thing of mother's attention. It was just like being in paradise. It was... I could feel her love. Mm. I just did not want to leave that room when I when yeah. I finished. I was just... Yeah. This, yeah. And she was saying a bit up, a bit down, you know, and so on while I was spinning. Yeah. And, uh, uh, can you just I... move a bit towards Chris so we oh, can sorry. And um yeah, so I I didn't think I was thinking how on earth am I going to do this? But somehow I did it and it came out perfectly, except that I couldn't get the sleeve to um lie mm -hmm. properly, you know, with the lining. And uh so Nita went and packed her shumatogy and told her the trouble I was having. And she said, just tell her to turn it inside out and iron it from the other side. And I did it. And of course, it was perfect. Wow. Um, yeah. So <laughs> did you carry your sewing the... machine and stuff to do all this? Oh, Sorry? Did you carry your sewing machine and stuff to oh, do? Oh, well, it was all done by hand. Uh, um, and maybe the 
I can't remember about the shoulder. Maybe there was a machine there. It wasn't it wasn't one I had anyway. Maybe there was a, sh a machine there or else I did it all by hand. Probably by hand because it wasn't very much. Okay. Except I had to set the sleeve back in, but yeah. Amazing. Um, I, oh, yes, I remember now. Nita had a sewing machine. Yeah, oh. it's come back to me. Yeah. Um, I was good for that. Who did you think was all the sound that time or different time? Um, that was that time. Um, oh, right, that's right. When I was asked to go down, yes. she imagined you said to Nita to ask me, she had some tailoring to do for Sis CP. And I said, I don't do tailoring. I'm not a tailor. Because I was obviously a bit nervous, you know, oh my goodness. And uh, when Nita told she mattered Jesus, she said, who does she think does everything? <laughs> 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 so the whole thing was a bit of a lesson in that, really, because by some means I did this incredibly complex, really, tailoring job not being a tailor and it came out perfectly and when I and it was amazing when I left Judy Camps mm. no when she left Judy Camps because it was supposed to be that time that she was going to sell Judy Camps so it was supposed to be the last time she was leaving in actual fact it didn't happen for another couple of years I think but I was there when she left and we were kind of in the hall to mm -hmm. say goodbye to her and when she went past me she she said bless you bless you bless you and and she said I'm very pleased with you my <laughs> CP's very pleased with you my family are very pleased with you we're all very pleased with you, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so that was that was and another miracle that happened there was that um I had the two girls at that stage and I was 37 and I knew I wanted another child. I actually, in my heart, I wanted two more children because I wanted four. And also I'd had for many years since Lakshmi was little and I'd seen these little twins playing in the um, doctor's surgery or clinic. Um, Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to have twins? Uh, this time they were a boy and a girl and I was watching them. And uh, so I'd also, in Italy, I remember having a chat with a yogini there about how I wanted twins and she also wanted twins. And, you know, most people thought I was mad. But um, I, uh, so, so I, as I said, I was 38 and they were at this 37. stage, 37. Okay. At this stage, they were five and seven. And... So I was sitting in front of Judy Camps. It was a lovely May, May day, beautiful sky and sparkling. And mother was inside. And I was just sitting on the ground. And I suddenly started thinking about having, now. maybe now's the time to have another baby. <laughs> and it suddenly just rushed into my attention. Mother, please let me have twins. And I was just covered with a shower of vibrations. I mean, really obvious, you know, it was, uh -huh. I was, I kind of thought, well, I didn't think it meant I was going to have twins. I just thought maybe it's because it's so auspicious thinking about having a baby and, you know. Um, and so anyway, um, and apparently mother said at that time to Nita, how many children does Ruth have now? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that that week when I went back, or after when I went back, I became pregnant almost straight away in that week, and it was twins. I mean, it's just, it's just, it defies belief, really. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Dr. Mataji again and again, isn't it? Like, um, yeah. did she, did Shumatji give you any advice on children as such? Did Was there any sort of spontaneous conversation when you were there at Shudi Camps or otherwise? One thing that happened before we had any children was that. We were asked to look after someone else's child while they while they went off to India. Oh, and, that's a uh, Yeah, and so we had this child who was quite caught up. I mean, he was very caught up, and um, probably because of the past of his parents who had been involved in um, TM, and mm. um, 
so but we worked on him and we were very firm with him but loving you know, there was yes. something lovable about him he was of what one and a half two 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 and Alan, Bruce's brother, helped as well, and we also took responsibility. Oh, I was but... pregnant then. Were you really? it, well, yeah. two months pregnant. Okay. Yeah. So we had it for about nine... the twins um, with the first Lakshmi. Child. Yeah, our the first, first child. Yeah. First child, yeah. Um, so it was a good training in a way, and and um, yeah, we heard that mother said they know how to look after children in preschool. So she was pleased and that was good. Yeah. Well, he did change a lot in that time. He did. Oh, he did. He did. Yeah, yeah, we were very strict. Because um, he wasn't our own child, it was easier to do, I think. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's hard with your own children. Yes. You know, you get more <laughs> guilt about it. It's yeah. fantastic. Fantastic to hear the story. Gosh, amazing. Incredible. So, yeah, it was sort of not so much, I think, advice as um, sort of practical experience. Yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah, yeah. Everything. There was that funny time when you were worrying about Lakshmi not having any tight soil in school. Oh, yes, that was... That was at uh, Fishy Park. Yeah, but I can't remember the whole story. Oh, right. I went past the door. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, that's right. I tried to scoot past the door because Lakshmi didn't have any tights on and then... And you were thinking it's quite cold and mother likes them to be sort of... Yeah, you know, and then she dressed. said said she should have tights on, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. On. <laughs> Something it like that. I can't remember the exact thing, yeah. no. <laughs> um, but that, that was funny. Um, what else is there? Well, so, um, yeah, I mean, you were staying with London. Well, after but the end of that last visit to Bristol, um, and she told me to write this book on art and so on, and I was thinking... It's very difficult to get any work done in this ashram. We've got this one room. We've got a child with us in it and so on, you know. And uh, how are we going to move on? And the day after she oh, left, yeah. um, my grandfather, uh, who was the only one in the family who was well off, um, wrote to me and um, said he was passing on some money and it was enough to buy a house. So... Um, which of course in those days were a lot cheaper than that. But that the money was, was a lot more than in those yeah, days. You could like that. That. Yeah. So it was a miracle for us, you know, a very material miracle, a but blessing. a very yeah. necessary Huge. one. So we were able to yeah. uh, move out. Um, and then sometime after that, um, Sri Mataji wanted us to move to Italy. Uh -huh. So uh, we kept the house, we let it out to some yogis, but and this is the same house we're in now. Uh -huh. um, but we, so we moved to Italy, and um, I think it was probably something to do, well, I don't know, it could have been many aspects, the sort of English connection with the soul, of, you know, which is Italy, and um, enabling the heart to communicate more, express itself more, maybe something, because she moved several English um, people to Italy at this time. Right. Is this uh, when Cabela was? This oh. is before Cabela. So um, there was a big house on Lake Como uh, called uh, a little village called Galate, and this was a rented house. And lots of, um, a few yogis lived there, so Ruth and I lived there. Remind us the time, please. Date here. Yeah. The time, which year, when was it? Uh, so this was actually was five, 1988. Yeah, yeah. 88. Uh, we moved over finally. Um, <clears throat> she'd been sort of hinting strongly that we should move for some time, and then finally, uh, we got the possibility of moving. So, so. um, and yes, yeah, so it was a big house, it was partly paid for. The rent by the collective on the basis that every weekend about 40 or 50 people from milan it was about an hour from said. milan would descend on the ashram and stay mm -hmm. there eat there eat a lot there uh, which was oh, <laughs> a lot so of cooking oh my god yeah especially for real it was incredible and the kitchen and, and the clearing up afterwards wasn't all modern like you know yeah. 
modern kitchen and it was yeah it was the dishwashers and what have you uh, there was a dishwasher but it never worked and, was yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yeah it was all the pans i mean you had to scrub these enormous pans and yeah so, but i like enjoyed for them. the weekends how many yogis would oh, usually about 50. yeah it was about 50 five um, hours. often i was cooking for 50 people and it was yeah it was it, it was a place where it was a real churning of egos i think yeah. so everybody who ended up there was like under the magnifying glass and you were being really given a good going over and it was hard because we saw ourselves you know and we didn't it was the things that happened there were not normal I mean it was like there was one incident when we first went there where um there was this girl from India very nice mm -hmm. girl called Nandi Nan Nanda. 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 Nanda, Nanda, yeah. Nanda um, married to Alberta. Well, she came to be married to Alberta. She was about 19. And she discovered while she was there that she still had... We thought she was very listless when she came. She used to sit around looking out the window. She had tuberculosis and she'd had it for, for years. And so uh, she had to go into a sanatorium. Oh, wow. and, but basically the whole... It was a big ashram. Mm. The whole place had to be vacated. Yes. Um, for three weeks, every single item in the ashram, including every bit of cutlery, every single had to go out onto the lawns. Yeah. Washed and cleaned, and in that period, was... there was only sun and wind, so it was like the perfect weather for sort of drying all this stuff. This was before. Amazing before we moved out and they were spraying the house and then they spray the house and yeah. then people had to have injections and all sorts of vaccinations and then mm. um the children especially then we went to stay in Javier's flat in Milan for three weeks and uh it just that things that happened there were kind of larger than life if you know what I mean yes. it was kind of extraordinary and obviously for a reason some mm. stuff was being cleared out and and it was very intense and we found it very difficult yeah. You, you can carry on the story. Um, well, I was working in Milan teaching English uh, with some of the others, uh, which was all right, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, again, living collectively, you know, it's difficult to get any work done, really a sort of mental work, you know, intellectual work, very difficult. And I didn't have the library there, English library, that I could use so on. Um, and yeah, it got to the point after about a year and a half where we wanted to go home. We really uh, wanted to go home. Yeah. But she mattered, you tried to work it out for me there as well, which I, I realise now, but she, because I had at some point showed her some drawings I'd done of sort of fashion designs, and she said, these are really good and you should do something with this, and mm -hmm. so... A yogini, an older yogini, had a sister who had a fashion business in Milan. Right. And she introduced me to the sister. And uh, the sister offered me a job. And I mean, I was scared. I didn't want to leave my, you know, Milan was quite a way away. You yes. had to go in every day and would have been changing everything. I was used to looking after my children all the time. And, mm. and so I kind of, I kind of pushed it away, away a bit by saying, "I, I'll start. I'll do it when I, when I've learnt. I was doing Italian lessons in Milan. When I've learnt more Italian, because I knew anyway, mm. the communication would be a bit difficult. But that wasn't really it. It was more that I was, I was scared of going into it. And so I sometimes look back and think, and I never did it. And I think Mother was giving me a chance. But mm. then, you know, what? What would my, you know, what would I have become? What would have happened? I don't know. So yeah. I didn't do it anyway. And we we were so, frustrated, weren't we? Yeah. I mean, yeah. one uh, one nice thing that happened for me when we were there, I'd been writing this book um, about Jesus. And it was um, as seen through, <clears throat> well, I, really, I wanted to talk about Paul's attack on Christianity, the really roots of Christianity. And... Um, so is, this book was called Sophia. Share the book. Yeah, this book. 
which eventually got published. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and <clears throat> so um, uh, quite a few of the Italians, they started reading it uh, in English and they really liked it. And um, a, quite a wealthy lady who was coming to the meetings got a friend of hers to translate it, paid a friend, and the friend was really nice. And uh, it was all very positive. Yes, and I think a lot um, of seekers read it as well, a yeah. lot of people coming to the meetings. Because I think, because it's very good for the Lepishudi, this book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's that, that strong Roman Catholicism there, and they found it very soothing. Yeah, for the Lafreshudi, so I think that's it's quite poetic. Yeah, again, it's it was trying to integrate a sort of uh, argument with poetry, and um, yeah, one time we were back in England, we'd come over for a puja, and I was on a train with Sri Mataji, and they called me into her compartment, and um, someone was telling her about this book that I had written, and, and Sophia, yes, yeah, Sophia. Uh, which hadn't been published at this point, you see. And mm -hmm. um, he started saying, it's, you know, it goes like this and so on. She said, I know, I know everything, which is very reassuring, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And she said, I, I should uh, put a bit at the end about her, specifically mentioning her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, they wouldn't get after me like they got after Rushdie. Who'd written this awful book about the night's children yeah yeah the um whatever it was and um so i needn't worry <laughs> i didn't think they would being christians they're all wishy watchy but, <laughs> um, but anyway eventually we published that back in england but so there were some nice things that happened yeah, she there. talked to me about sophia as well yeah. the book and when i went down to shooty camps that time and was asking me about it and she said this is good and oh, that's right. She turned to Cersei and she said, Her husband's a very great writer. Yeah, oh. that was nice. So, all these, you need encouragement because you're not getting it from anywhere else, um, not from the publishing industry by any chance. Can I tell the miracle about the India miracle? Yes. So, um, yes. So, while we were in India, uh, no, in Italy, Italy I went, you went to India. To, yeah, I'd been on one tour yeah. a couple of years earlier. And then Remind you were, us the year again, please. So when were you in Italy? Well, Gary was two, so it would have been, she was born 85, 87, 87, uh, 87 or 88. Yeah. Yeah, I think she was coming up to three. It would have been 80, 88, yeah. Okay, 1988. Um, so there was one very big miracle, um, which was, I mean, I can even feel it before I start talking about it. <laughs> I have got suffered a lot from that and, so when I was in India, I, you know, sometimes I would get very concerned that mother wouldn't put her attention directly on me because she'd know, well, I knew she'd shown me so many times. She knew exactly what was going on in my mind and so on. And so there was one day in Pona where she built the amazing house. We went to a craft market, the yogis and Shimashi and a lot of her family. And, um, all the time at this market, I was following, everyone was crowded around Shumashi and I was following at a distance because I I didn't want her to put her attention straight on me. And so I followed at a, a good distance and all, she was going to all the stalls and so on. And eventually I kind of saw these silk paintings and I forgot about it all and started to buy some silk paintings. And when I finished buying them, which took ages, you know, in India, things can take a very long time. So. And um, I looked up and everyone had gone. So all the yogis had departed, mother had departed. There was no one, hardly anyone in the market left. It was obviously near to closing up and they'd all gone. And I kind of just relaxed and thought, oh, I'll just have a quick look around the store, see if there's anything I'd missed, you know? And as I was walking along, <laughs> Sri Mataji was walking towards me and obviously I, I did namaste and she said how are you Ruth and I said very well thank you mother which was my usual reply even if I wasn't very well and uh, she looked at me with such compassion and she said just enjoy just enjoy <laughs> and she walked past 
And then I, uh, you know, a couple of seconds later, I looked round, she wasn't there. And so when I went back to the camp, went back on a rickshaw, I knew where it was and everything, that far. And um, I said, I, I just saw she mattered you and she spoke to me at the market, you know, and they said, you, that's impossible because at no point was she on her own. She left with everybody and that yeah. happened. She, yeah. she manifested <laughs> because she could feel my... Amazing. Josh from asked you again. Yeah. Be happy, basically. And it's I'm just, not making myself happy. Yeah. It reminds me of um an experience. I think Shankarji is a better person to share that story, but she did tell him to, you know, she said, enjoy, enjoy. Oh, enjoy. enjoy. Yeah. Like, wow. And that's that's the key to to life, isn't it? As as Sahajiogis. Yes. You know, I had that problem a lot of torturing myself. Yeah. And what's the point? I mean, you know, because you spoil everything and you spoil yeah. the moment and, you know, and there's nothing to do that for. And sometimes I would kind of, she would get me out of it for a bit. And so I'd have a very nice little time. Yeah, amazing. She literally stopped my thoughts. Yeah. It happened yeah. at Shudi Camps as well on, on a Guru Puja when the girls were small. And I had really had in my heart this desire that I wanted to be at Sri Mataji's feet. I just want to be at Sri Mataji's feet. And it kept coming into my attention. And so I was just at the back of the tent with all the mums. You know, your your children are taking your attention. It's hard to put your attention fully on the puja. And suddenly someone came to the back of the tent and said, Sri Mataji's asking for you on stage, personally. Oh, and so I was like, you know, and I went went up to the stage and I just it was bliss it was like when she was looking at me and yeah. the time that I did the, the jacket and I must have been on stage for 20 30 minutes I don't know how long and um she got me to put a um anklet on her and I can't remember whether it was the left or the right probably the left <laughs> anyway she 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 held it in her hand and showed me that the right side of it, and then turned it over and showed me the wrong side, sort of putting me in a relaxed mood, so I'd know I was putting it on right, you know, and it was just, it was just blissful. I, and I literally could not think. That was the funny thing, that she just took my thoughts away so I could be in complete bliss. And that was... well, the vibrations was just so amazing. I was just... Yeah, it was very beautiful. Oh, beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. Just to feel that love on you, it's just indescribable. So that time also, uh, when you were in India, Mother must have told you, um, or somehow you got the message to me that I was to write a substantial book about Sahaja oh. Yoga. Um, and... Which year is this when you were in India? She must have talked to me about it. Yeah, either talked to you or someone to someone else who yeah. passed it on. I mean, she did say to me in India because I I remember going being at her feet, just chatting with some other people, and she was talking about I've got some saris and and it was about saris. I can't remember what, but anyways, I felt I felt all right. I didn't feel that horrible uh, feeling, and um, then she said come and see me at, I can't remember what the place was, one of the places we were going to. And when we got to the place, instead of going and knocking on her door, or at least standing outside her door, I waited to be asked, you know, again, which is just like someone would come and fetch me. Crazy. But anyway, so I've always felt a bit bad that she asked me to come and see her. And what would she have said to me if I'd gone to see her, you know? Mm -hmm. And I never knew because I... No one came to fetch me and I didn't go. And obviously I was supposed to just go and stand outside her door and present myself. It's, yeah, yeah. Obvious. it's obvious, but obviously there was something in me which was yeah. Yes. Me that. Yeah. So which year of this India tour was this? Must 1988. 1988, okay. And and what was this book that Shumataji asked to write about Sahaja Yoga? Well, this one eventually became this third book here, Sahaja. And so she wanted a, um, yeah, a substantial book. That's the word she used. 
about Sahaja, an introduction, but a sort of deep one. Um, and again, I, <laughs> I've been working on this. I remember the very first time she came to Bristol in 1980, she uh, talked to me about this and how I should uh, write it. I should um, sort of talk a little bit about how I came to Sahaja Yoga and, and so on. You know. um, she but, said from your, you have to do it from the point of view of your seeking and then coming yeah. in and then yeah. going from there. Um, and, you know, I was trying to write this blessed book and uh, it just wasn't working out. I mean, again, I was um, doing it in a sort of conventional way, quoting lots of people, you know, Gibran and yes. Christ and Socrates and whoever, and sort of kind of supporting all my points with these quotations. But then I thought, you know, in the end, I thought, what is the point? If someone doesn't accept my word, why are they going to accept you know, Socrates' word or his. So, um, and it, it was sort of channeling my desire to write this book through the sort of roundabout other people's thoughts and so on. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's a talk, I think, a Guru Puja talk, where Shri Mataji says, you know, what does it matter what Socrates said? What do you He's say? Saying, you know, yeah. something like that. And um, so finally... She used to ask every time we went to see yeah. her at the airport, how's the book coming along, yeah. Chris? And yes. you always just say, it's coming along, Mother. <laughs> it was going to be a nightmare. How long did it take you then to write it? 14 yeah. years. But again, I, I sort of finished one version and another yeah. version. And a, yes, of course. Another... It's it's always, you know, I mean, as a writer, you're just constantly honing. Yeah. Well, because it was kind of working on himself, I think, and probably a lot of yeah. other stuff as well. But finally... It's happened again at the airport, and Mother said, "How's the book coming along, Chris?" And he's... which year is this then? Oh, I don't. I don't know which. No. It would have been nineties oh. something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it must have been because it was 90s. near to when you actually finished <laughs> yeah. it. So, Late. um, he said it's coming along, Mother, and she said, "Many people are writing books about Sahaja Yoga, but it's yours I'm waiting for." And. Yeah. Uh, Shortly after that, he just got the inspiration and he just wrote it. And every time he wrote a version, I would read it. And that time, it was the right. It was right. Yeah, yeah. It funny. Yes, it felt right to me. Yeah. And um, it was very hard not to challenge the ego in that. Yeah, in that I book, mean, wasn't it? At this point, by the time it got uh, written, we had some very negative things, a real attack on our family, and I think it was that that really prompted you know as a response the the power to to write what i feel is, i mean it's a long time since i've reread it but i do feel it's a good book it's, it is good. it's, it's very good yeah it's again got that integration or that's what i was aiming for of um feeling and uh, intellect you know that was uh, what was so hard get, wasn't yeah. it? and some people i know have said it really helped so it's there and at present, I'm I'm going to write a sequel of a kind of sequel, um, but anyway, that's another story. I mean, I've written several more books, but those are the three: Sophia, Sahaja, that one, and Art, Love, and Truth that Mother talked to me about and encouraged yeah. me. Shall I tell, tell her that um, dream that I had about yeah. when I just got well, not that long after we got married, to do with Chris's mm -hmm. work. Um, a very powerful dream I had, which was I was back in my childhood home in Bristol, and um, I was standing in the doorway, and she matched you was at the top of the drive, and there was enormous. The sun was behind her, her head, and she, she did namaste to me and said, um, "I had a na nappy bucket. That's right, and I was filling it with earth." And I knew in the dream that this earth was something to do with Chris's writing. That it, I was somehow preparing something for Chris's writing. And um, yes, she, 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 did, she did this. And then she said, thank you for doing this work for me. And, you know, when I look back on that, I think that was amazing. Very profound. Yeah. Because yeah. Ruth has had to suffer a lot through, through this, through my putting my attention always on 
you know, this writing, which is, has not been in any way lucrative. Um, uh, and she supported me in this. And uh, it would have been very, very difficult, if at all possible, without her. So, um, Yes, actually, thanks for putting that into context, because the dream sort of makes it more comprehensible to the people who will watch this interview with you in terms of, okay, that was an amazing dream and Shumatshi during Namaskar, but that's essentially because all the things that you do to keep the family going, looking after the home, the husband, the, you know, just you had, luckily you have a home, but to keep everyday life going as normally as you it's hard work as a homemaker, as a mom, as a wife, as a yogini. Yeah, yeah. It's Sometimes. interesting the dream that she was up at the top of the thing, because even though she, she did this, she was clearly the one up there. Oh, you know? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. always, always. Hey sun behind her head you know and that must have helped you in the challenging moments because um, well, I didn't really it's realize not just a couple it's, it, it's, at the time. It's, it's just over the years that you know I realized that that was and the nappy bucket you know the domestic <laughs> of all the things <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 oh fantastic it's been great talking to you uh both uh such a such a delight. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us and putting these memories uh, for everyone to enjoy. Is there is there any any other particular thing you want to share with us? Got most of the stuff uh, in um, that we that we had thought of. Yeah. Have a look again, and uh, because it's it's really nice, and I know Felicity has done the book interview where you've uh, I haven't seen it, but I haven't done the Bandan one, but I did it in the other interview. So you have, yes, you yes. have the power of Bandan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the main thing I would want to say about Mother to people who weren't with her, I didn't have that opportunity, was this quicksilver way she had of changing from moment to moment, from mood to mood. Sometimes she was in a very sort of, uh, you know, human uh, kind of housewife, mother type mood. Uh, sometimes she had to be in a way because uh, she was having to do something for her husband, you know, uh, his job or whatever. Yes. Um, and then in a split of a second, she should she could become the goddess uh, considering some very deep problem that someone had. Also, I mean, the just the endless compassion, you know, seeing her at meetings, when the early meetings, when she would come round after her talk and oh, work on people individually amazing. and give so much attention to them, knowing if she had thought of it. I mean, how does God work? I, I don't know. Uh, this is one question I really wanted to well, ask. That's an en enigma that's meant to remain an enigma. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it happened in um, Bristol. I was with her in the car, and I, I didn't have a specific question in mind, but it would have been a deep one. And I said, may I ask you a question, Mother? And she said, yes. Uh, and then I asked the most stupid, trivial question. It was about something about acrylic clothes or something. I mean it was it was I mean it wasn't stupid but it was just so I know what you mean. trivial, you know. When what I wanted to ask was how does how does how is God who knows everything, past, present and future, how is the world interesting to him and our everyday stupidities and our good points and that you know um which is, as you say, an enigma and is meant to be an enigma uh, mm -hmm. and we can't answer it. Yeah. Uh, but it was very odd and I was aware of it at the time how my attention, not through my will, but was diverted yeah. from asking she something didn't want serious. didn't to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Your experience anyway. this reminded me of, you know, how we were talking about Shumataji and how he, she could be in one form, you yeah. know, and, and change quick, very mercurial, quick silver light from one moment to the other. 
So this is way back in Delhi, near Delhi in Connaught Place. And I was working with uh, India Today at that time. And I had a small photograph of Shimataji, the one that we have here on oh. my desk. Oh. And uh, my boss, who was the uh, director uh, of India Today, he he used to you know walk past. And he said, yeah, how do you know this lady? I said, she's my guru. And uh, uh, I said, do you, do you know her? He said, oh, she's she's amazing because she, apparently, and he told me the story, Mr. N.B. Singh, bless him. Um, and they were at a party, at a dinner party. And Srimataji was sitting near him and... Uh, after the dinner, during the dinner, she told him, you've got this back pain. And he had an excruciating back pain, but because it's one of the do's, you, you really just have to be and put up with the pain. Shamataji knew and out of her compassion, after the dinner, she took him to the next room and just cured him. The pain was gone. Uh -huh. And there he was. I mean, he wasn't a Sajiogi. He was a very good person, very good man, and a top class uh, media professional uh, oh. in the heydays of his career, really. And and here is Shamataji in her compassion, curing him of a pain that he had for a long time. Uh -huh. um, good story. A blessing. Yeah. It is a blessing. So it's it's just not for the Sajiogis who we sort of pray to her and we see her in that form but in her her compassion sense beyond yeah. isn't it yeah and then on a whim she or apparently to us she yes. just has someone and then other people might maybe it doesn't happen yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean she chose chooses mm. Mm. so yeah it's been it's been a joy talking to you ruth and to you chris thank you so much you thank very you. much. Thank you. 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 Th